Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Robert Gruden um, was educated at Harvard. He got his PhD in comparative literature at Berkeley, taught most of his career at the University of Oregon, and is probably one of the, probably the only uh, um, uh, professor of literature and philosophy whose homepage is on the Foresight Nanotech Institute. So if you want more information about him, you can find him there. And uh, with that, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Robert Gruden. Could you check my sound? <clears throat> my voice, I hope, will improve, but uh, the, the sound is all we need right now. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, there are scams. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there are scams and scams. There are scams directed to, by one person towards another or by a, one person towards a group or by a group towards a person. There are scams that are only one-shot deals. There are scams that go on forever. And there are scams where the scammed are aware that they may be scammed, but pr participate in the scam anyway. Among those, one might count love and divine truth. I'll tell you a scam that until a couple of weeks ago I was under, and that you, you guys may still be under, because no one's ever talked to me about it. Um, just, just to bring up uh, one living scam, and that's, that's the scam that a Prius gets f over 40 miles per gallon. <laughs> um, I've researched this intensely. I, I, of course, I didn't buy a Prius because it would take me forever to get in, get in line and get one. But the scam there is, although a Prius will go 40 miles or over for every gallon you put in, it takes gallons and gallons of energy to create the electricity that also powers the Prius, because the Prius alternates between um, fossil fuel and electricity. And in areas where electricity is, is um, expensive, that can add up to more than $10 a tank. And I can tell you, I come from an area in um, Hawaii where energy is very expensive, and you know how they get it? They burn fossil fuel. And many other uh, parts of America burn coal for their energy. <clears throat> so that when you hear an announcement about a new technology gaining all these miles per gallon, you have to think to some extent, this is a scam. And these people are trying to compete with very good European turbo diesels that get nearly 40 miles a gallon and perform beautifully, but are not available in the States because of market pressures. And they're also competing, of course, with fuel cells, which don't use, don't use fossil fuels or electricity at all. They use um, a kind of reverse electrolysis. Anyway, there's nothing more exquisite than the momentary sense that you have been made a fool of by some corporate entity. And you, you see right through it. And, and this is how my book begins. Just a minute. My stopwatch. This is how my book begins. It starts off <clears throat> in the spring of 2003 when CNN and all the cable uh, networks and the big ones were concentrating on the Iraq war. Now, you saw two huge phenomena in the sp that spring. One phenomenon was a, a war that was being very accurately reported by, pe by reporters who put their lives on the line, and many of them died. They got so close. 
The second phenomenon was that you saw just about the biggest mushroom in viewer share for American TV um, since 9-11. Uh, what was going to happen, these TV producers asked themselves, what was going to happen when the war was over? Was there any way that they could keep that enormous multi-billion dollar viewer share, that, that spike? Well, they thought of one, the Lacey Peterson murder case. The moment Baghdad fell, there was this lurid yellow journalism that came on and that was covered without stint for the next 10 days. Now, what we see very easily what was going on there from an economic perspective. Um, there had been an enormous economic advantage and people were trying to prolong it. But from a cultural perspective, an entirely different picture emerges. And that's a picture of a, net, uh, a series of networks, or let's say corporate America, <clears throat> um, capitalizing on America's lowest instincts, the prurient instincts that make us think of female corpses, pr pregnant female corpses, um, family intrigues, underwear, and all that kind of thing. And that, uh, that in the old days was called yellow journalism, and I, I, um, perhaps we um, can still use that term. Anyway, um, I would like to come to you and say that, that um, the vulgarization of American ta tastes for power and profit is specifically a Republican business and that if we all vote Democrat, it'll all go away. Untrue. Vulgarization is shared by power mongers, both among the liberals and among the conservatives. CNN is well known for uh, its comparative independence from the Bush regime. And the Bush regime hates CNN, fears it. But CNN was as much a part of the vul vulgarization of uh, the Lacey Peterson phenomenon and American tastes as <clears throat> any conservative might be. Because whether you're liberal or conservative, you want to maintain your power base and make it as large as possible. Um, in some cases, no matter what the con consequences. Anyway, the first half of this book is all about various kinds of vulgarization perpetrated um, by uh, corporations, by publishing houses, by priests, uh, and uh, more or less by an, anyone who is um, trying to sell something no matter what the consequences. And so there are the typical um, vulgarization, vulgarizing effects as in fast foods and tobacco. But then there are much subtler ones, as in American higher education and um, American publishing and liberal politics, etc. Once I get an idea into my head, I work it to death. And you can see that, uh, that happening in my book about time, my book about creativity, my book about dialogue. Now I'm doing it with a book about vulgarity, except with my book about vulgarity, there's a new twist. Because thinking about vulgarization, I had to try to think about its opposite, its antidote, so to speak. And I decided that the antidote was, a, um, the, was the idea of consciousness. Consciousness, just like vulgarity, can be defined in a variety of ways. And so what I wanted to do for you today is show you the way in which I define consciousness, and in particular, social consciousness. Now, in chapter three of my book, just for starters, I take 
the reader into a town in Texas. The year is 91. Yeah. Maybe the vulgarity that you speak is the necessary price in democracy. Compare it to the absence of such vulgarity in the Soviet TV or the monopoly of British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, that is right on, and that's in the book. So I actually have a chapter on that. <laughs> that that's in my, ch uh, my section on consciousness. Um, I'm going to hold myself to a, uh, to a time limit. So let's do Q&A after I get done, because I'm afraid of not telling you everything you need to, to know in order to ask the questions. <clears throat> um, in chapter three, I take the reader into a, a town in Texas uh, and a bizarre murder case. Uh, you see, I do yellow journalism myself. And I'm wearing yellow, of course. The, uh, the, murder, the murder fortunately never occurred. But it was one mom, one um, high school mom, trying to murder another high school mom so that the other high school mom's daughter would not win a cheerleading contest, would not make it to the cheerleading team. This was a town where the girls thought nothing about nothing except cheerleading. Cheerleading was the rationale for their existence to the extent that one m mother would hire a hitman to murder another mother. So the hitman, of course, got to thinking, hey, <laughs> my, uh, my dignity as a hitman has been offended. And he went straight to the police. <laughs> and that's how, uh, that's how all of this got to common knowledge. And it became a Hollywood movie. OK, moving right along. What I want to do is um, a thought experiment having to do with cheerleading teams. And so now I'll take you to the beginning of, um, of part two, which is my section on consciousness. Imagine that you were a 12-year-old girl in Channel View, Texas and that your culture, the values and language and hearing in your small branch of society is dominated by athletics and cheerleading. The cultural sun rises and sets on cheerleading. Girls practice cheerleading moves at home, on their way to school, and in the halls. To be selected for the cheerleading team is every girl's dream, and not to be so selected is the most miserable form of failure conceivable. You are a member of this culture, and consequently, you are locked up in its compulsive enthusiasm and appalling tunnel vision. Well, uh, just to, uh, to set this in perspective, right now, all of us are, in a mem are members of a culture that value things like 40 miles a gallon. In, in other words, um, we ourselves, are, um, I, I certainly was, locked up in a situation where thanks to certain choices that had been made outside of my purview, um, I believed in certain things that weren't true. But one morning, and just imagine this, everyone shut their eyes just for a sec, one blink. One morning you wake up and sense that something has changed profoundly. The morning sunlight is projecting the moving shadows of leaves upon your bedroom wall, and the free play of light and shadow fascinates you in a completely new way. What has caused the change? Was it something a teacher said yesterday or something you read last night? Whatever it was, you suddenly realize there is a world out there beyond cheerleading and that, in fact, this other world may be full of things far more important, urgent, and wonderful. So <clears throat> that's a moment of consciousness. Uh, you could say also it's a mo moment where someone for unaccountable reasons, moves beyond a given paradigm. And it's a very pungent, poignant, let's say, and ironic moment, because simultaneously you are liberated and you feel a power, almost like, uh, like wings. Simultaneously you are liberated and you are alienated, because once, once out of that paradigm, 
you can't go back to its comfort. And all of the things that gave you social pleasure before have to be given up now in the light of your new realization. And if you're going to have a social network, it's got to be found outside of the, par the, the paradigm dwellers who have now become like cave dwellers to you. So consciousness involves um, two very important elements. One of them is you're looking at a, a subject, um, trying to understand its itness, so to speak. That's where we get the word quality. It's, um, that word was invented by Cicero um, from, from the Latin word qua. He just made it a substantive. It's whatness, as in quid and, and quod. You under, trying to understand its full quality, but consciousness also implies separation, alienation from, from the very context that you're trying to understand. And uh, for more advanced forms of consciousness, sometimes there's both. Sometimes, you, as when I talk about American culture as an American, Sometimes I have to realize my connectedness, my implication in American culture, as part of the critique I'm trying to do from the outside. Because of limited time, I now want to move straight to the, um, probably the conclusive chapter of part two and talk to you about a very specific kind of consciousness. Social consciousness. I wanted to talk about social consciousness at Microsoft because Microsoft, as one of the world's most powerful players in terms of corporate individuality, has an enormous effect in terms, uh, on society in terms of creating value, creating riches, creating knowledge. And um, I wanted to um, re reflect on, a, on a, a little bit of the other side of things for you. And so I'm going to a very other-sided situation. The childhood of the abolitionist Frederick Douglass. I don't know if you've uh, made contact with Douglass recently. But the more, uh, the more contact I make uh, with him, uh, the better it is for me. He wrote at least three biographical works, and these three biographies <laughs> differ in many, many essentials from each other. It's almost as though he had three lives. But um, I'm going to read from uh, probably the most popular of them. You see, Douglas was half white. But he never knew who his, who his dad was. His dad may well have been uh, one of the people who owned him, owned his mother, so to speak, in those days. That's what they said. And he went forth to a variety of households in Maryland as a slave and as a kid. But people realized, were always realizing that he was a very unusual child uh, and um, thinking about what was best for him. So here he's in Baltimore, back in the home of a guy named Hugh Auld. And Auld finds out that uh, Mrs. Auld has been taking the little boy aside and teaching the little boy to read. And he flies through the ceiling in righteous indignation. He takes, uh, takes the boy into a corner and, and says, now, said he, if you teach that nigger, speaking of myself, how to read, there will be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good but a great deal of harm, and it would make him discontented and unhappy. Okay, now Douglas comments on this. 
These, these words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering, and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation, explaining dark and mysterious things, in which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. Though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with high hope and a fixed purpose, at whatever cost or trouble, to learn how to read. Now, in this passage, which I have ex excerpted, uh, I haven't read you the whole thing, I found a model for how um, a form of social consciousness is born in a living mind. The first thing I feel as I'm reading this passage, and the thing that poor little uh, Freddy, as he was called, must have felt at the time, was misery and pain. So for me, the origin of this kind of social consciousness is pain, frustration, sense of impotence. And I remember feeling the same thing the moment the idea for this book came into my head. I felt uh, when, th when the TV stations came on with Lacey Peterson, I felt that I was part of a victim of an atrocious scam, and so were my fellow Americans. And I felt impotent, felt frustrated. But Douglas didn't stop there. He's, it occurred to him, even as a boy, that this was not just a divine state of events, a divinely imposed state of, offense, of, 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 of events. It was not part a, a natural occurrence. This was something that some people did to other people. The black man to the, the white man to the black man. And so what he realized was, for the first time, a sense of injustice. There's, this isn't just something that makes me miserable. It makes me miserable because there's something wrong about it. There's something, something deeply wrong. Now from there, his mind makes another leap. And that, that next leap was, if it's something that men do to other people, then there must be a way of, of stopping it. There, if, if it has its own cause, opposition can also have its own cause. This is, uh, this is not written into stone as the way of the world. Finally, in a, in a section that I haven't read to you, Douglas has another revelation, and that other revelation is that in giving Douglas the speech that he's just given, the slaveholder, Mr. Auld, has compromised his own strategy. In other words, he's been vulgar in, trying to, in showing how he vulgarizes and demeans the black man. He's giving the black man an insight into attaining his own liberty. And liberty, of course, means, again, young Douglas understood very profoundly, prophetically, liberty means access to knowledge. And the final step, of course, is as he learns how to read and write, Douglas is acquiring the ammunition, the armaments for his own salvation for the ab abolition of slavery, in which he played an important role, and for the establishment of political equality. So anyway, this is a very specific kind of social consciousness. I, I could talk to you about other kinds, you know, about how, how we should treat our children and, and things like that. There, there, are, there are other issues and other issues in this very book that are described. But in this issue, I feel an enormous sense of identification. In, in this particular set of circumstances, you first feel the pain, then you feel that it's unjust, 
then you feel that it's um, a human agency that can be reversed, and then you set out to reverse it. And um, without sermonizing, I would suggest that if you guys, next time you ever feel that sense that you're being crushed by something that's more powerful than you, you start um, thinking about how it can be fixed, even, even from a personal agency. Right now, I would say, and in fact, my advice to anyone who feels crushed is gain knowledge. The, the first response to, to a social scam is to gain knowledge. Put yourself in the picture as, as, um, as completely as you possibly can. And if knowledge is being unfairly withheld, um, uh, challenge it. Let's see where we are. In this chapter, I not only discuss the, the birth of this social consciousness, but I also discuss its nature. And I want to outline I want to out outline um, four key elements of the kind of social consciousness that I admire. Social consciousness addresses issues. And now I'm going to take you into the debates regarding the Iraq war. I, th I think you all know that in the, the early years of the Iraq war, 2003-2004, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of static in the press about whether the Bush administration had been honest in, um, in outlining their reasons for the war. Well, finally, one columnist, who is uh, Tom Friedman, came out, and what year was this? August 2003, Friedman came out and actually proposed what the underlying reasoning of the war was. And what he proposed would look rather silly to, any, right, to anyone right now who has been following the war. Because Friedman, um, for example, um, I don't read anywhere in journalism that anyone knows what the, what the real difference between a Shiite and a Sunni is. I've never read that. I, I've, I've done the research myself. I can, I can tell you roughly what the difference is and why that difference has, has made unrest between them for hundreds and hundreds of years. But I've never seen um, anybody in the Bush administration or the Democrats or the journalists talk about the difference between the underlying ideological difference between Shiites and Sunnis. And there's a great deal to talk about. But anyway, in the old days, Tom Friedman, just the way I did, thought that the uh, Muslims, the Islamic states in the Middle East were sort of a block, and that if you knocked down the, king, the kingpin in the middle of them, the biggest army, you wiped out the biggest army, it would soften up the rest of them. And that, that of course, was the opposite of what actually turned out. We had a heck of a lot to learn. But at least at this point, Friedman was giving it a try, as no one else did. Shortly afterwards, however, um, uh, what's the guy's first name? R Rich, what's his first name? Oop, Frank Rich. Did I just lean on something? No. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, Frank Rich came out with a, uh, a, a much more satirical and biting article about the war, uh, in which he said, the war was waged to, in order to win the 2004 election. Okay, so that social consciousness addresses issues. Social consciousness appreciates continuities. And that is, if your life is going along and all of a sudden something very precious 
is slowly sapped out of it by some uh, by people in power. You ap appreciate that, you rely on that, and you publish on that. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Victor Klemperer. Um, he was from a, a Jewish family that converted to Protestantism in the early 20th century, as many Jewish families did, um, including the Wicht Wittgenstein family. Uh, the Nazi regime did not accept his conversion, and so he was stripped of his power. He was a lit professor, and he was put onto the reverse gravy train that would ultimately take him, if he, uh, if he didn't escape, it would ultimately have taken him to the death camps. Anyway, ironically, he and his wife lived in Dresden, and when the Allies ordered that, that terrible bombing raid on Dresden, they both escaped in the confusion. But here is uh, Klemperer, be, uh, long before his escape, talking about his stay in prison. They, brought, they, they took him to jail for a while. My trousers are slipping, my trousers are slipping. What good is all the philosophizing about the inviolability of one's inner moral dignity? I experienced the misery of slipping trousers, then of the tied-up trousers, as the, as the most extreme humiliation. Well, why were his trousers slipping? Because many inmates committed suicide by hanging themselves from their belts. Because of that, the, um, the Nazis removed every man's belt when he, uh, he walked into the jail. And what um, Klemperer is doing here, as he does throughout his ver this very well-written memoir is he's establishing his own spiritual loss in terms of human continuities, the continuity of a man's dignity, of, of his pants not falling down ar around his ankles, and other continuities. Um, social consciousness maintains perspective. Now, we can imagine a town like Channel View, Texas, being separate from other towns in Texas and establishing more or less its own set of values. That becomes a bubble, and that becomes a loss of perspective in the long run. And the ex example I use for social consciousness and perspective is the so-called um, Magdalena, they were called the Magdalena prisons, I believe. Mag no, sorry, the Magdalene asylums. Anybody see that movie? Uh, I, I, I guess it flopped, but anyway, it was a perspective on asylums in Ireland that were run by the church. And um, if a, a girl in a village near these asylums happened to be too pretty or too popular or too social, or if she got into trouble, the asylum would just snap her up, and it would be like a lifetime prison. She'd be made to work um, something like 364 days a year, one day a year off, and there would be no appeal. And these things were going on through the middle of the 20th century in a world that, uh, that otherwise saw, uh, especially among the English-speaking peoples, um, a great emphasis on civil rights. And the only reason they could go on is in an isolated setting and a setting that, lang that lacked perspective. Or a setting where the powers that be felt that they would benefit from having, uh, f uh, from taking perspective away from people. Now, corporate settings can do that. Um, because corporations can become worlds unto themselves. They can't do it to the extent of the Magdalene asylums, but the, I like to use extreme examples. Okay, finally, social consciousness. Al although it can conquer everything else, cannot be truly viable without self-awareness. 
And in self-awareness, you're trying to, to get yourself, you're, 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 you're sort of putting yourself and your own position into the mix. For example, at, at the opening of his book, uh, Les Fleurs de Mal, The Flowers of Evil, Baudelaire dedicates the whole book to the hypocrite reader. The, the, the whole idea is that you readers, you're all hypocrites. And then he says, mon semblable, mon frère, and I'm one of you, I'm, uh, I'm, and I'm just like you. So what Baudelaire is trying to do is, is incorporate his own self-awareness in his social consciousness. Well, I think it would be a good time now to, um, to, for questions. Uh, just to put you a little more in the picture, I have a long chapter on the education of the vulgar. And um, oddly enough, I have a long chapter on Homer. Because Homer, to me, is the, um, the founder of Western social consciousness. Yeah. I'm sorry, you two are in a line. So why don't we give you the chance first? Then we're gonna give you second. Huh? Pardo second. Okay, you can go first. Um. By the way, Jonathan, do we have mics in the ceiling? Yeah, they can. They should be able to pick up the questions. Okay. So the picture seems to be that Volker is bad and conscious is good. And it yeah. doesn't seem convincing to me because your examples of revelations were um, chosen in such a way that you were on the positive side all the time. I can't imagine revelations of a negative side. You know, you live in Nazi Germany and suddenly you understand the superiority of Aryan race. And it's kind of revelation becomes your conscious. So conscious by itself, I don't think necessarily carries this positive sign. Um, uh, what did Hitler do to advance human consciousness? I'm, I'm, I'm failing to understand you. I don't know what's conscious, but the, the proof was by way of revelations, examples where this abolitionist fellow suddenly understands something. And examples we always sympathize with this guy, and he's on the on the positive oh, okay. side of history. And we can easily imagine revelations of that sort when somebody understands something. But what he understands, and the world reveals himself, and he understands the wrong, wrong God. Suddenly, he becomes a polytheist instead of moving to monotheism or to atheism. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I didn't catch all of that. But I, I, let me say that this book, at its best, is tendentious. In, in other words, of course, I have a thesis. And of course, I'm trying to, uh, to think of, of very, very dramatic examples, um, hoping that they will carry moral, uh, moral authority. And if that's what you wanted to point out, that indeed is one of my limitations. Sir, what would you say are some of the self-defense steps one can take against the manipulation uh, by corporations, politicians, advertising, marketing, whatever? You may have covered this earlier, I'm not sure. In the first place, there are people who, will do, who do it for you. So this book has a number of, um, of heroes. For, uh, one of the heroes is Alice Waters and her food revolution. Uh, which is not just a food revolution, it's revolution in health and education. Another hero is John Bonzoft, who is an East Coast law professor, who spearheaded the legal drive against tobacco in the 60s and 70s, and now is going after, in the early uh, 21st century, he's going after fast foods with lawsuits. You, you can pick up a leader and follow and support. If if you're a loner, however, ever, the idea is to research and publish. And um, I, I was on the, uh, the has, has anybody here used Rightly, the new word processor? 
Well, you, once you use rightly, you won't believe how fast you can publish on the internet. Um, it's, it's just an incredible new, new concept in uh, communications because you're actually working on your own manuscripts on the internet and you've got uh, options in every upload and download direction including immediate publication. Uh, just to go into this for another moment because I'm, I've, currently I'm trying to learn how to present on the internet. Once you have a page that's established on the internet, you've got to make it searchable. It's not going to automatically be searchable just, just because it's up there. The search engines have something called a bot, and the bot is a crawler. And for the bot to crawl your manuscript, um, you have to have, um, you have to, you have to encode certain keywords that will tell the bot what your manuscript is about and what your, what your title is and all that. So anyway, there are, of course, technical issues to be overcome when you're trying to publish on the internet, but they're not that difficult if, if a non-geek like me can actually do them. And uh, a number of my pages now are searchable. Yeah? I'm interested in, you know, for the purposes of developing hope, fostering hope. Uh, I'm interested in your views on why widespread individual awareness would be uh, viewed as the economically favorable path. Money's what makes the world go round. Money's what drives vulgarization. It brings eyes to the pages or, or yeah. to your programs. How do we how do we make that the, the more favored Path. Well, uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you that I've proven myself right on this. But one good example would be to to, um, to follow the the course of uh, follow the history, which is only eight years old, of Google.com, because Google.com used a model completely different from Microsoft. Um, which, of course, is a, an incredibly successful company. It used a model uh, very different from Apple, um, and it had phenomenal su success. And the, the model, of course, was the gift. You give knowledge. You give power. People, on, uh, people within this vast worldwide net appreciate that. They take to it. They exploit it. They, uh, they rejoice in it. And... Then you sell advertising. Right. Those, those links are sometimes paid advertised links. Sure. So that's not a that's not an abuse free uh, situation either. And Google is not. I mean, Google's a company. Google's a business um, in the business of making money. Uh, yeah. Well, it, in fact, we're all in, in the flesh business. <laughs> you know, the, but. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that Google, Google succeeded using methods of, of gift and offering, and they, were, they weren't just giving freebies, no, li like a, a free laptop or something. They were giving power. They were liberating me, for example. And uh, I liberated myself by using Google Pages, so, um, which are very much like Rightly. And anyway, um, we're, you know, we're all enmeshed in material life, and there, certain models succeed and others fail. But when, if you want to succeed and be happy, you probably want to use the most genial available model. And on, on top of that, just to say one more thing, supposing you have succeeded, even then your su success may corrupt you or, or someone else. So there, there are a different additional onion shells to peel off on this whole issue. Uh, you speak about liberation and awareness, but it seems quite apparent that these are only things that are available to those who we consider to be the elite, both yourself and the academic community and ourselves sitting here now. Um, you mentioned the Lacey Peterson scandal, and I think we can all agree that because of the circumstances of the case, if she would have been an ethnic minority, or transsexual, 
um, there wouldn't have been the same attraction. Maybe you can speak to the masses as to why Bulgari seems to be so appealing in American culture and how we can get at that through ways that are actually more accessible to the layman. Yeah, we're now, um, we're now moving into my next book, which is a, bu a, a book about, about the idea of design. Anyway, this book, the, the last chapter of the first part, has to do with um, vulgarity and nature. And it has to do with an, ec an economic and political idea known as the growth model. Whether or not you know this, the growth model has, uh, has an enormous effect on your lives because city planners all over America are using it to justify development. Now, among others, the World Bank has realized this and they've begun to think about capital in new ways. Um, and in fact, uh, th th these ideas go back to that um, famous book, The Death and Life of American Cities. They th they, uh, the World Bank has begun to think about human capital, environmental capital, uh, and other things in terms of making its loans. And so in this chapter, I take a, um, a given city, I think a city of about 200,000, and I, um, I theorize about how it can grow without growing in development and population. So one way it can grow is by, say, establishing a college there, a liberal arts college, to take a certain amount of, of investment. The growth in value there is that graduates from that college, if the city has never had a college before, graduates will be better qualified for advanced positions. And uh, they, will, they will populate advanced positions in the area. They'll create more, um, more money, more capital growth. And I take up this issue again in the design book. When, when you do have um, a growing class, a growing professional class within a given area, you have demands for quality of life that have never been there before. It follows almost on a one-for-one one perspective. So what I was trying to say is um, uh, people do have this in mind right now. Are we, uh, is this over now? You can finish it. Okay. Some people, as in the World Bank, um, have issues like this in mind. When, you, uh, when you're thinking about what you call the masses, the first thing I would think about would be John Dewey's idea of education and that had a, a really successful run for a few decades in America universal education, and I'd also think about health issues because if uh, probably the first thing a, a human being, the first step a human being takes towards um, enlightenment is through the body, through fitness and through health and through caring about the future. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>